Boys Up Girls Hope is an international organization headquartered in St. Louis, 14 affiliates in the United States and two in Latin America. And we're celebrating 40 years and 20 years in San Francisco. And our mission is to strive to nurture and guide motivated young people in need to become well-educated, career-ready men and women for others, all of you. Um, I'm really excited today to kick off Career Panel with um, my friend and colleague, Chef John Ash. And I, I wanna share a little bit about him before I turn it over. And many refer to John Ash as the father of wine country cuisine. In 1980, he opened his namesake restaurant, John Ash and Company in Santa Rosa, California which gained international acclaim. John has written five books and is a two-time James Beard Award winner. His latest book, Cooking Wild, was published in summer of 2016 by Running Press. He is at work, he is at work on a new book called Soup, the Original Comfort Food. In addition to that, John is devoted to ethical, arc, ethical agriculture. He was honored in 2014 by the Monterey Bay Aquarium as Sustainable Seafood Educator of the Year. So I'm really excited that all of you get to meet him today. And he's going to cook a special dish for you, and you'll have a time for a question and answer. So John is sitting about 12 feet away from me. So I'm going to take the laptop over there right now and let him speak to you and answer your questions and get on with this show. So good afternoon to you all. Yes, yeah, say. So one of the things, it's it's a funny thing, and I mean it as a funny thing, but in the restaurant world, uh, you always address the chef. You never say, how are you, sir? Any of those kinds. It's always, yes, chef, to to whatever the chef asks you to do. That's the, that's the response. Uh, it's, there, there were, actually was a wonderful little book written about it, uh, written by someone who worked in the restaurant business. And the title of the book is Yes, Chef. And uh, it was it was a woman and she couldn't she couldn't stand it. She <laughs> so she really put it down that whole idea. Anyway, uh, I guess I'm supposed to tell you a little bit about me and kind of my journey and pathway. And mine is um, my path is an interesting one and not dissimilar to a lot of chef types that I know. I never intended to become a chef. Uh, I always loved to cook. I, I, I won't make it a long story, but I grew up with my grandparents on a ranch in Colorado. We were poor mountain people. Uh, and one of the things I had to do uh, was to help my grandmother uh, cook to feed the hands who worked on the ranch. Uh, and I will say that even as a little kid, I think I can remember back to about age three, it was such a magical experience because she she was just a great intuitive cook. She didn't use recipes, she didn't use that, but she just took whatever was available. And we really were poor mountain people. I don't think I, we knew it at that time, but she dealt with whatever was on hand and turned out the most marvelous food. And so it was it was kind of a magical thing being around her. Somehow, I think that that's what got planted in my mind was that idea that uh, cooking could be this magical thing. But again, I never intended to do it. I went off, went to school, went to college, actually graduated from uh, college as an undergraduate in fine arts as a painter. Uh, I knew, however, that I was never going to make a living as a painter. Very few people do. Um, and I discovered somewhere along the line that everything I ever wanted to do with paint on a canvas, I could do with food on a plate. Uh, same, you know, the same, it was actually the same thought process and all of that. Plus, food on a plate, you got to eat it. Uh, <laughs> paint on a canvas. Uh, one of the stories I always tell my mom before she passed away had all these god awful paintings that I did. And I would uh, ask her always, just would you take those paintings and burn them? Uh, she never did, uh, which was very sweet of her. <laughs> but it was that whole idea that uh, food you got to eat, uh, painting 
have a way of hanging around for a long time, uh, even if they're not very good, especially if, if your family owns them. But it's uh, it, there is that connection there. And there are many chefs I know who have started off in mechanics and done all these things, but it's that whole idea of being able to use your hands to create things. And a big part of this is, and you may have heard this, that at least 50% of the enjoyment of food, and probably more, is visual, is how it is presented to you. This doesn't apply to McDonald's and places like that because it's not very pretty. Uh, but when you think about pretty food, uh, it, it really uh, it makes you hungry. One of the thing, one of the places that I've taught for many years is the Culinary Institute of America in the Napa Valley. And so I work with some of the young chefs who are training professionally there. And one of the assignments I give them is to make beautiful macaroni and cheese. And of course, they look at me and say, you know, I can see what's in their minds. Macaroni and cheese, isn't that the stuff that comes in that little blue box with that uh, extraordinarily orange colored cheese that you put on the top of it and all that stuff? I say, no, 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 that's not macaroni and cheese. And as they think about it, uh, some of the most beautiful presentations have come up simply with the use of a little cheese, a little milk or cream, and a pasta shape of some kind, uh, maybe even making your own pasta so that you can do it whatever you want to. And it teaches them about the idea that so much of the enjoyment of food, kind of life, comes in through vision. So when you, when you try. So that was my... I guess my beginning. I did that, uh, ended up working when I got out of college for a company, a San Francisco company that's still there, still headquartered there. They're not nearly as big as they used to be, called Del Monte Foods. Huh? They were famous for canned corn and canned pineapple, and all of that stuff. And uh, it was it was an interesting experience. I learned a lot about big food, you know, the places where you're moving lots and lots of stuff around. But I have to say that I worked there for five or six years. Uh, my last job with them was developing new food products, which uh, it wasn't from the kitchen side, but from kind of the marketing side, going out and looking around sort of saying, mm, I wonder uh, what the world is missing right now. And can I tell you my great success story, if I had a penny for every can of those that uh, was sold, I would not be on this television call right now. I'd be in the San Juan Islands someplace, uh, enjoying myself, going fishing and stuff like that. Anyway, I helped develop a product, uh, which I think is still in the market, but you youngsters may not remember it, called Pudding Cups. Huh? <laughs> and what it was, it was these goofy little hands uh, with a pull top on them that you had pudding inside. And the reason that we got onto that, it wasn't that I had any great love for pudding, uh, but we found out because we had canning plants, canneries in the Midwest, they reported to us that dairies there were dumping milk down the drain. They couldn't sell it, especially a grade of milk called grade B milk, which didn't mean it wasn't drinkable or, or uh, wholesome. It just meant it didn't meet the butter fat requirements, all of these arcane things that uh, the government puts on food sometimes. So they would either, they would feed as much of it as they could to animals, but the rest of it, they would just dump. So that meant that we could get milk for free. And that was the basis of pudding cups. What can we do with free milk and turn it into a marketable product uh, that would make money for the company and all that stuff. So that was my great success story. Uh, <laughs> I tell my kids that story and they just, their eyes just glaze over, you know, they roll back in their head. And all that stuff. But the point of that was it, it was an interesting company to work for and it was interesting to, to do uh, work on new ideas and things like that. And then when I got kind of, it was kind of a slow moving company and, and I was still a young man and I said, I'm getting out of here. Uh, so I saved up all my money, quit, and went to France to, to both to experience the culture. I'd never been there, uh, never been to Europe at all at that point. And at that time, France was the holy grail of fine food in the world. It was the, and it still is 
when you go to a cooking school, a professional cooking school, it's still the, um, it's the thing that, it's, it's what's used to teach people to cook. So it's French technique, typically, even though uh, I often say French cooking is fine. I think I like Italian better. Uh, and in recent years, because I've had a lot of ch chances to travel to the Far East, especially Southeast Asia, that's mm -hmm. the best of all, you know, but, mm -hmm. uh, but still to learn how to cook uh, uh, the French technique is the way to do it. So I went again with no intention of doing it professionally, but I went to, went to school in Paris uh, for a couple of years and then was just lucky enough. Is this too long winded? Am I going no, on and we're, on? We're okay. We have about Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it to you in two minutes. Okay. So this is how I ended up where I am right now. I ended up uh, going to school there, doing some fun things, and ended up, just by chance, hooking up with a French family who had a wonderful little inn in the north part of Burgundy. And it was the kind of thing, I was a commis, huh? a slave in France, French, that means slave, uh, in the kitchen, but we never wrote a menu. The menu changed every day. Mm -hmm. And we never wrote a menu until we went to the market very early in the morning and picked out the very best things we could find. And we would come back, sit around the table, drink a lot of coffee and uh, decide what the menu was gonna be that day. And when I came back to America after that period of time, after spending my couple of years there and working uh, in Burgundy, I said, that's what I wanna do. I wanna try to recreate that uh, experience here. And I lived in San Francisco at that point, but I'd always loved Sonoma County. And hopefully you've all been here, but Sonoma County is very, it feels like the French countryside. And so this is where I settled and it's where I started. So there you go. So like all of us, you too, you're going down a particular road and then suddenly uh, something comes up and you take a right and uh, you're going in an entirely different direction. So, so be open to that. Uh, as I say, I never would have believed when I was uh, 25 years old that I would be a cook, a chef, a restaurateur, and all of that. That wasn't my intention. But it's amazing that when things come along, how it changes your life. So that's my story. What's yours? <laughs> uh, it's, it's simmering away. Uh, one of the things about cooking pasta, we're always told, huh? Yes, that you always want to have salted water. So the question for you is, and you'll win a prize, whoever asks, answers this uh, most correctly, how much salt do you put in the water? I'm pretty sure it's I'm pretty sure it's enough until the water is like um, salty like the ocean. Uh, so, I, Sorry, Issa, repeat your Do you need me to repeat? What was yeah, that? Can you repeat your stuff again, Issa? Okay, um, I'm pretty sure that you're supposed to salt it. Like there's not a measurement or a ratio, but like just until it's as salty as the ocean. Uh, well, you're pretty close. Maybe maybe you get a half a prize or something like that. The answer to it is it's, re it's really kind of silly. You want to make sure that the water tastes like the sea, huh? which oh, means it's, pre it's pretty salty. So I think you were you were on the right track. So uh, And so it depends on if you have a pretty big pot like this. You don't have to measure it. You don't have to do anything. You just throw it in there it, and then you taste it. One of the things you have to learn how to do is to stick your finger in boiling water and taste it. And, oh, yeah, it kind of yeah. tastes like the sea. So, okay. so that's pretty good. So they're, they're going to go. Um, so, Cacio Pepe, I have a couple of different, uh, you can use any long pasta. So, here is some linguine uh, or bucatini, I'm sorry. And bucatini is really interesting. Let me uh, step away, open this up for you because it's a like spaghetti, but it, uh, and it, you kind of look like it. And of course, you're not going to be able to see this. You're going to take my word for it. Uh, but this is what it looks like. And right down the center of it, it's, there's, it's hollow. So mm -hmm. there's, it's, and what that does is another place for the sauce or the butter or the olive oil and all that stuff to, to get into so you get even more flavor there. So I think we might use that. The other deal about good pasta, pasta is not expensive. Uh, but what you want to look for is pasta that has been made with, and typically this only happens in Italy, but some American producers do the same thing, uh, that has been made, extruded with bronze dyes. They actually take the 
the pasta dough and, and shove it through these things. And what it does with the bronze dyes, it actually creates uh, a little ridge, little ridges on here. And again, it's just a way of helping the sauce stick to the pasta. Uh, sometimes I still see, so don't ever do this. If you ever see anybody do this, I want you to beat them up or something like that. Never, ever, ever put oil in the water. I still see recipes that uh, give that instruction. And the reason for that is that you don't, that you don't want to do that is the oil cooks the pasta and then the sauce can't stick to it. So it, uh, so that's the deal. So we'll get these, we'll get these going. Let me crank this up here. And so we got the pasta cooking. It's going to take a few minutes for this to cook. Uh, so I'll tell you about the rest of this. Uh, we have some, so here's the deal. Butter goes in here. And some good butter, uh, not really cheap butter. Mm -hmm. uh, some pepper, some Parmesan cheese that we finally grated here. So here's a block of that. The pepper should be freshly ground. If you have a pepper mill, you can like this, you know, you can grind it that way. But I find that it's easier and better to take a, uh, take a coffee mill, uh, which can double as a spice grinder too, and put the, the peppercorns in there, and we'll plug this guy in, and zap it up. You can just get it in there. There. Okay. Zap it up in here and grind it up. And by doing this at the very last moment, you get this extraordinary all of the the the, the yeah. aroma and flavor of pepper dissipates very quickly. And actually, two days from now, this won't be the same. It'll be just a shadow of itself. So that if you can always grind pepper freshly. That's kind of what's but you do that in your world too, mm -hmm. with Indian yeah. cooking. It's yeah, always right. it's always the mm -hmm. at the very last moment. Mm -hmm. that, yeah, yeah. So let's do this. So we've got the pepper, we've got the cheese, we've got the butter. Now we just have to wait for the uh, the uh, pasta to cook a little bit. And what I'm going to do is save from this. I'm going to grab. Some of the pasta cooking water. And what this does is it, it enables us to form, this is a little technical, but it's actually sort of fun. When we have the butter uh, in there, what we do is we whisk it around and add a little bit of the water. And what it does is it thickens, it forms an emulsion, it's called. So we just want to be able to do that. It makes the, the pasta better. Okay, so. Cooking away, cooking away, waiting, all of that kind of stuff. And as I mentioned, all kinds of things, you could top this with anything. Uh, so if you had seafood, leftover chicken, any of that kind of stuff, you could toss it in. Right. Well, we wait. This might be a good time for some question and answer. Yeah. yeah. Perfect, you guys. Yeah. Let's take on some questions. If you guys, we know that you guys all prepared some questions for them. So please, um, I advise you guys to unmute your mic when asking questions. But let's go ahead and ask some questions. Ask the question. Do you ever second guess your decision um, to become a chef? Um, did you feel pressure from anyone in your family to follow a more traditional life path? Uh, you know, I never did. I was lucky in that regard. My father was a doctor, was an MD, and. Uh, I used to, when I was a little kid, used to, he. this was back in the days when he would actually make house calls, you know, you could call the doctor and they would come to your house to check you out. And so I would often go with him on those calls. And I, it just wasn't for me. I just somehow, I never, and my dad didn't, he didn't put any pressure on me. He just said, do what gives you great pleasure. So that's, that's the deal. That's not always the case. So the question was, what's my favorite thing to cook? And my favorite thing to cook is whatever I have. <laughs> yeah. And one of one of my inspirations, which I love doing, and uh, and we have pretty good ones in America, but when you travel to other parts of the world, it's extraordinary, is to go to the market or go to the fresh market. 
and whatever is in season looks good to you is something you like that's what you get and that's what you cook great thanks Chef. Uh, are we doing what, what you mentioned um, or wanted to ask you what inspired you to write your books um well, that's a good question i I, I never thought, so this was another thing I never thought I could do was to write because I was not something that I was, uh, that I cared that much about. Uh, and the first book that I wrote was a friend of mine came to me and he had this idea for the book and the, the first book was called American Game Cooking. And uh, I knew something about it because I'd grown up on this ranch in Colorado and we did a lot of hunting. and. Uh, it was at one time, I think up until about 1900, the primary meat on the table in America was not farm-raised beef and pork and things like that. It was wild game. So it was venison and elk and uh, wild turkey and things like that. Uh, and my grandparents grew up in that time. So I learned a lot from them about cooking wild game. So it was just, you know, this word serendipitous it was totally serendipitous. He said, I need some help with this. I can do the research. This was he talking to me. I can do the research about the history of the game and all of that kind of stuff, but I'm not a cook. I need somebody to help me develop the recipes. And so that was my first book. So be open to those opportunities when they come along. Question. Uh, what's been your favorite experience during your career? Like you have a favorite place you worked or something like that? Uh, well, that's a good question. Uh, I think probably the, some, of, some of my fondest memories, I was lucky enough to get tapped to go to Japan to sort of give them a, some insight into California food and wine. And I did that for nearly 15 years. And I would go for a month. And I think the last time I went, I was there for about three months. And what it did was it gave me such an appreciation. Japanese cooking is also some of the most elegant and sophisticated cooking in the world. Uh, it kind of makes American cooking look uh, pretty heavy handed and all of that stuff. But I learned so much about another culture, about the extraordinary food that they did, the ways that they did it, like their kitchens are not set up like ours are. They use different utensils, all of that kind of stuff. But it was a it was an amazing experience. So I, I still draw on that. And the most fascinating thing that I'll say about, and it's, it's true of many cultures, but the Japanese especially, they are so sensitive to flavor that you can ask a Japanese person, what's your favorite soy sauce? And they will tell you, and they will also tell you, they can tell where you come from by the soy sauce that you uh, like mm. or, or do, because we tend to think of something like soy sauce as being just, it's just regular old Kiko man or something like that, which is a good soy sauce. Uh, but every village and town in Japan has its own soy sauce maker. And each of them, even though it's just soybeans and salt, uh, each of them are different, each of them. Uh, us, me, uh, it took me a long time to be able to distinguish those differences. Okay. We're getting this dish going today. I'm going to drain the, the pasta. I'll bring it right over to you. So here we go. Now I'm going to carefully measure, carefully, huh? I'm going to follow the recipe exactly. Don't do that. Just do it, you just do it to your own taste. So we're gonna throw in some butter, how much? Not that much, maybe a little more. Butter is great. Uh, it's beginning to melt in there. I, I've got my pasta water here to make a little emulsion out of this, a whisk. You can describe emulsion. The, oh, the emulsion is just, it's that kind of magical place between solid and liquid. So what I'm doing, the uh, and it's when you have fat and water or, uh, together. So I, I, I don't know whether you can see here. You probably can't. 
I'll hold it up and you can kind of see what's going on. But I'm whisking this around and I want to just lightly brown the butter so that it takes on a little bit of a nutty flavor. I'm going to dump in a little bit of the water and now I'm going to whisk it. And what it's actually done is it's thickened. So the water and the fat together, the fat and the butter together, and come together. I'm going to dump in the pasta here. So again, you can use whatever you want, spaghetti, vermicelli, uh, fettuccine, any of those kinds of things. And what I'm going to do now is take this, I'm going to put the cheese on, how much? As much as you like, like so. Okay. It's actually not so much because it's very finely grated. I'm going to add just a touch more of the water to make sure that it has a nice consistency. Like so. I'm going to put in a pinch of salt and then as much pepper as you can stand. Uh, but it adds, it, it's so fragrant and it's so delicious. Then we're going to take it and I'm going to move this out of the way and see if we can dump that. Uh, Camera down here. I'm going to take a bowl. Which one? How about this one? It's pretty. very pretty. Mm -hmm. Very pretty. And we're going to take the pasta, nicely thickened now with the pepper on it. We're going to mm. put it in the center and maybe give it a little twist if you wanted to, like so. And any of this sauce, most of it has been absorbed by the uh, by the uh, pasta itself. So there it is. I'm going to finish it with a little more cheese. Huh? You can slice that cheese. And if you wanted to, you could taste it and add even some more uh, pepper to it if you wanted to, depending on how peppery you liked it. And we're done. So let's eat. You want to put it? Yeah, I will put it next to you. I'm going to put it in front of you and then you're going to eat it. I'm going to eat it. Yeah. Okay. So it couldn't be simpler. Better than macaroni and cheese anytime. I want to show this to you now. Oh, can you see it? Or hang on. There we go. Kids are talking about how it's making them real hungry. <laughs> so it, it it looks amazing, and I. <laughs> One of our collegians really likes the plating too. They said 10 out of 10 on the plating. <laughs> oh, they like your plating. Oh, yeah. Very fancy. <laughs> okay. Mm. Mm. Obligatory really? chef kiss there. Mm. I could just send this to all of you. <laughs> mm. Mm -hmm. Well, I have to say the bugatini is, it's it's different from spaghetti or mm. fettuccine. It's got a little bit more texture yeah. and, and the, the Parmesan, uh, it's so creamy and the, the, the pepper, yeah. it's, it's exactly. like perfect. It's yeah. got a little bite to it, but it's it's absolutely perfect. Um, well, I'll be over there. <laughs> no, uh, this is this is wonderful. Th thank you. Thank you. Did you all enjoy that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, who's, show of hands. Who's going to try this out to, tonight or this weekend? I hope you do. I want to. I want to. I want pictures of them. Um, I'm going to turn it right back on to you, uh, Chef. On Ash, but so they can ask you questions. Oh, you're very excited. <laughs> mm. Okay, any other questions that you have? That's great, thank you. Um, Eugene, go ahead and ask your question. Okay, uh, in your opinion, what's your most uh, impressive dish that you made and why? Oh boy, That's impressive. Uh, impressive dish. Mm -hmm. So I guess we'd have to define impressive. I think the most impressive one I ever did was I was very young into my 
uh, cooking career. And I did something that I watched Julia Child do. Mm. And I said, I can do that, I think. And what it was, it was something, it was called salmon chauffeur. And chauffeur means hot cold. Mm. And what it was, you poached a whole salmon, stuffed it with all kinds of wonderful things, and did this white, uh, cold sauce, gelatinized sauce, over the top of it so that it looked like a piece of marble uh, and then decorated it with cut vegetables and things like that. Oh. It took forever, uh, but it was really delicious. I don't mm -hmm. think I've made one since. <laughs> you know? No. Great. Julian, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, I got like two questions. Okay, go for it. I, I wasn't here for the whole thing, so how long does this- Where were you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm good, thank you. <laughs> how long does this beautiful dish take to make? And are the ingredients pretty easy to get in like the city? And yeah. yeah. So the answer is you can get anything, uh, especially in the city, anywhere. We, we're so lucky where we live. If we lived in Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, it would be more, it might be more difficult. But like the dish that we just did, you can go to any market and, and get it. Uh, ready to ready to go, and as I say, make it in about nine minutes. You know, for, for what you. nine yeah. minutes? Yeah. So all, all we're doing, the only thing that takes any time, is the cooking of the spaghetti mm -hmm. or the pasta. So wow. that's all right. Wait, can I ask another question related sure. to the sure. pasta? Is there like a perfect minute or like a perfect time to cook pasta, like so it comes out like? perfectly soft and oh well that's a good question so that's a very uh individual thing uh many a times like this one is and i'll let you talk to that is a little chewy mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of people like it that way uh some mm -hmm. people like their pasta a lot softer and so what you want to do there's this term that's often used when you read a recipe for pasta it'll say cook al dente and al dente means teeth you know, cook it to the tooth so that it still has a little bit of texture, a little bit of bite when you bite into it. But if you don't okay. like it that way, just cook it longer. <laughs> you know? Oh, okay. It's really up to you. So there is no perfect way. All right, all right, all right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay. Um, we have one, one more question from Grace. Okay. So last question, and then we'll take a big group picture together. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Grace. and um, Hi, Grace. For you, do you have any favorite Mexican recipes? Oh, I do. I've I've spent a lot of time in Mexico, uh, and I I think it's unfortunate that a lot of Americans think Mexico is just beans and cheese and burritos and things like that. But I've been lucky enough to go several times to Oaxaca and spend some time cooking down there, and the food is so amazingly different. And Mexico as a country as you move around Mexico, each each of the states of Mexico, there's di the food is different uh, there. So there's no, it's not just the, it's not Taco Bell. Having spent all this time in Oaxaca, uh, because that's the home, though they're made in other places in Mexico, are the moles, you know, the seven moles of, of each color, because they're so rich and seductive. And I think they're just fabulous. You can do so much with them. Thank you. You're welcome. What are your favorite? What's your favorite Mexican dish? Um, mine's is rajas con crema. Say again, I'm sorry. Rajas con crema. Uh-huh. It's like, it's chile kind of, it's chile pasillo with chicken and cream. Yeah, it's, it's really good. Good. Okay. So can can you send up two orders right now? <laughs> um, I can try. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm teasing you. I'm teasing you. When I when I come to San Francisco, we'll we'll meet up and go to your favorite place. That's great. Well, on on the behalf of our, our scholars and our program, we just wanted to say thank you, Chef John, for doing this for us. It's really great. It's something easy for our kids, something that they definitely have um, in their fridge. So we definitely appreciate the time and um, commitment that you have dedicated for us this evening.